Okay, so I've been reading this book. It's called On the Trail of the Serpent. It's about one of the most famous serial killers of the 1970s, Charles Sabraj, a.k.a. the Bikini Killer, a.k.a. the Serpent. I printed out pages from the book because I want to use them to demonstrate how much power this guy had over other people. It reads, she had to admit that Charles was charismatic, sexy, and domineering in an almost hypnotic way. Even so, at the back of her mind, she wondered if he was using tricks he had learned from all the psychology books lying around his flat. This was said by his girlfriend of the time, curious by his ability to control people. But this is just a one-time occurrence. All throughout the book, it discusses his charm, his enamor, his ability to befriend and influence the people around him with ease. He was so charming. He had... And he, he sort of emanated a power like, you know, very major movie stars have. They yeah. have a kind of a power field around them. Mm. And, and he had a gravitas as though he was some sort of important scholar. Even his Wikipedia page describes him as handsome, charming, and utterly without scruple. So yeah, obviously this guy was quite the charmer. Through all this manipulation, it makes you wonder, just like his girlfriend wondered, what tricks he was learning from the scattered psychology and self-help type books scattered throughout his apartment. If we study the psychological tricks taught in these books, would we be able to dissect his actions, his methods of manipulation? Unfortunately, we'll never know what books he had lying in his apartment, but I think I might have something better. Take a look at this book, The 48 Laws of Power. It's a book that legitimately describes itself as immoral, cunning, and ruthless. One of the reviews online reads, this book would be more aptly titled, How to Be a Psychopath, Strategies of Manipulation and Deceit. Looks like we found our book. The perfect source to peer into the mind of Charles Barrage, but more excitingly, the perfect source to learn how self-help fueled the creation of a monster. So there's a lot of people that Charles had around him being manipulated, but I think one of the most important was his assortment of girlfriends, lovers, significant others, whatever you want to call them. The women he had around him to help him in whatever he did. Just look at this. His main accomplice for many years is quoted, I swore to myself to try by all means to make him love me, but little by little I became his slave. Over and over again, he swept them off their feet and controlled their every move which was necessary because he wasn't always a killer. He started with the usual criminal behavior, stealing, scamming, selling of illegal goods, etc. So they'd be there to bail him out. They'd help him escape prison, distract people while he robbed them, give him intel. I mean, he outlined his approach clear as day in an interview from that book that I've been reading. It was always handy to have a local woman attached by bonds of love. She could be my spy, my translator, and arrange useful business contacts. Now it makes you think, what sort of psychological tricks was he using to encourage these women to stay? Well, we don't have to go far into the 48 laws of power to find out. Just take a look at law six, court attention at all cost. First of all, Charles needed to be good at catching the eye of these female targets. Make yourself a magnet of attention by appearing larger, more colorful, more mysterious than the bland and timid masses. At this point, Charles had learned to draw all sorts of attention, good and bad. In his years growing up, he learned to do so by spending most of his time revolting against his father, his stepfather, trying to run away or committing petty theft. So soon enough, through his psychology books or through real life experience, he learned he could use this attention to benefit himself. So in every social situation, he crafted his ability to seize hold of the conversation and gravitate eyes towards him. It could have been simple charisma or it could have been some sort of provocative argument, but either way, you best believe that Charles was attracting all eyes. But that's nothing without part two of this rule. Create an air of mystery. Do not show all of your cards. An air of mystery heightens your presence. Use mystery to beguile, seduce, or even frighten. Plus add in a little bit of law 16, use absence to increase respect and honor, and you've got yourself the perfect concoction of disturbing manipulation that Charles put into practice on a consistent basis. Once your lover's emotions are engaged and the feeling of love has crystallized 
absence inflames and excites. And if you look at how Charles interacted with these women, it's exactly what he did. As soon as he had captured their attention and fascinated them with his charm enough for them to decide to want to stick around, he would introduce a touch of mystery and absence. He would do weird things like obviously hide things from them. He would reveal that he had been using a false name. He would disappear for hours on end. Anything to keep them guessing, anything to keep them from getting bored. And the more they stuck around, the more he found ways to use Law 11. Learn to keep people dependent on you. Whether it be emotionally dependent, financially dependent, or both, Charles had these women locked into a trap. So this is what's really crazy. All these people are people that Charles controlled and manipulated at some point along the way, whether as a chess piece to his game or as a sucker that he could steal from. And for manipulating these kind of people, he had a whole different strategy. First off, he would pose as a friend, work as a spy. A friendly front will let you secretly gather information on friends and enemies alike. Here's his own quote to prove it. Every day, travelers deal with new faces, and so it's natural for them to make friends with strangers. Once they decide you're their friend, their guard drops. So Charles would spark up conversation with strangers, being ever so friendly, but the key was that he would listen to them and talk about the subjects that they wanted to talk about. He tricked them into believing that he was a great conversationalist, when in reality, he was guiding the conversation towards topics that they liked. After a short period, he would find out their weakness, the interest that they had that he could abuse. And here he would use Law 12, Use selective honesty and generosity to disarm your victim. So he would be generous and he would act as if he was letting them in on a secret. Quoted from Charles himself, he says, everyone has one weakness. As soon as you know, you let it drop that you have access to this wonderful girl or gem dealer or drugs or maybe an amazing investment. Then using a psychology model to match a person's character to a corresponding type, Charles would assess how this person would be of best use to him. If he couldn't use this person, he would simply rob them, drop a pill in his drink, help him back to his room when he starts getting sick, clean out the room of anything expensive, and then disappear from their life forever. If he wanted to use this person, however, he would go down an even more despicable path. I mean, just check out this quote. Laxatives first to induce illness so he could diagnose their complaints and offer helpful advice. Later, when their trust had been won and defenses disarmed, he would move in with heavier weapons, Largactyl, Quaaludes, Mogadon, and other assorted soporifics. Once he had dosed a man with Mogadon for a few days, Charles discovered he could make him do anything. At this point, he would take any valuables, cash, their passport, traveler's checks, and use them as he pleased. If this person asked for them back, he would simply explain, oh, I've put your valuables in a safe at the bank since you're still so sick and I'm out all day. Which perfectly flows into one of his most important rules, a rule that also overlaps with the previous section, learn to keep people dependent on you. To maintain your independence, you must always be needed and wanted. The more you are relied on, the more freedom you have. Make people depend on you for their happiness and prosperity, and you have nothing to fear. Once Charles had their passport and money, they couldn't escape even if they wanted to. Charles would then cover their expenses, feed them, house them, and take care of them while they were sick. But in reality, they were not his guests, they were his prisoners. He had tricked them into believing that he was acting out of the kindness of his heart to house them while they were under the weather. But in reality, he was just using them to fuel his illegal businesses. Okay, I've mapped out all the countries that at some point had a warrant out for the rest of Charles Sabraj. It's pretty insane when you look at it like this. And honestly, it's probably even more than this because I had to compile this across various sources on the internet and I might've missed a few. Anyway, I bring this up because I wanna talk about the most infamous part of Charles Sabraj. The reason he was nicknamed the serpent, his ability to evade and escape the police. And interestingly enough, it starts again with the manipulation of people around him. First off, he used Law 7, get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit. Charles always used others to carry out his crimes for him. Whenever he needed an accomplice, he could easily find them. He would simply head to a dive bar or an area where he knew low-level criminals hung out, and then he made it a game to find his next partner. It was a game he enjoyed, picking out a likely accomplice, sitting nearby at one of the grubby tables, striking up a conversation, and analyzing their potential. 
In this way, if the plan were ever to go sideways, he could use his accomplice as bait or throw the blame onto them and make his getaway. However, of course, this didn't always work and he was thrown into jail many times, but he seemed to somehow always escape within a matter of months, if not quicker. I mean, just look at this quote. In February 1975, he was sent to a high security prison on the island of Vagina. It was a place reserved for the incorrigibles and those facing the death penalty. From Vagina, no one ever escaped. It took Charles a mere two months to do the impossible. And of course, the tactics to do so involved his charm and his ability to seamlessly flow conversation to topics that the guards or the police enjoyed. But I think all of that goes without saying. I think what's really fascinating is his use of Law 22, the surrender tactic. Transform weakness into power. Weakness is no sin and can even become a strength if you learn how to play it right. Charles understood that he was weaker than hundreds of guards at a prison. To win this battle, he would have to play into that fact convince the officers to let down their guard. In order to do so, he would fake some symptoms of a gravely serious condition like appendicitis or a peptic ulcer. And so once he was rushed to the hospital, he was then left with a smaller group of guards of whom he could better get to know and manipulate. Almost always the guards became relaxed at some point, opening up an opportunity for Charles to escape out the back door or however else. So whether it was using weakness to make a play off of people's desire to be forgiving, or whether it was charm in everyday conversation, Charles Sabraj obviously manipulated using the psychological tips and tricks taught in self-help books like the 48 Laws of Power. It shows how incredibly powerful these tactics are in influencing the people around you, but I hope you realize it doesn't have to always be so malicious created this video to not only learn about the fascinating life of Charles Sabraj, but also to point out that you can use these ideas taught in this video to understand the rules of the game, to recognize when you might be falling into manipulation tricks, but most importantly, to use these tactics to propel yourself forward and make a positive change with the influence that you create for yourself. Okay, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end here. This one took more time than usual, more uh, researching, more writing, more editing and everything involved. So, you know, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, more to come soon. And so I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.